I'm going to be sharing some things today from the book of 1 Samuel. And you say, well, is, is there grace found in the Old Testament? Folks, there's grace found every place. 1 Samuel, and I'm going to be sharing the story of how Samuel got here, how little Samuel got here. He had a mother named Hannah, and she couldn't have children. And she prayed about it, and God gave her a child. But before we go much further, I want to say this also, that in the last few years, God has changed so much about what I always thought. And at one time, I would have thought somebody that thought like me was a heretic. I really would have. And I see you nodding, and you probably were right there with me. I mean, you would say, yeah, I, that was me too. But God has just shown me so much how much He loves me and how much He loves you. Now, I could receive how much He loves me. I mean, you say, okay, Lord, I'll, I'll agree. I, I, I don't really deserve anything. And you love me like Robinson was talking about today. And when he was over in, he was preaching today about the kingdom of God. And he was talking about why God loves us. And he said, I don't know. He just does. And then he kind of equated it. Well, why do I love my children? I don't know. I just do. Because they're mine. And that's how God feels about us. And I love to touch my children. I, now it's my grandchildren, my little ones. I love to hug them and tease them and play with them. I just love it. And it never gets old to me. And God feels the same way about us. Exactly the same way. Well, He felt the same way about us even before we were born. And today we're going to be looking at the calling of God. The calling of God. Now, I used to think that the calling of God was just for certain people. God called certain people. And then I would hear people say, God has called me to preach. God's called me to preach. And then I say, wait a minute now. Wait a minute. God has been showing me lately that God doesn't call you to do anything. He calls you, period. His own. Now, He gifts you. He gives different gifts to different people. And, and we, we basically walk and serve out of our gifting, not our calling. I want to say this. Now, this may cause some people to stumble. All have been called. Some people say, well, yeah, I can't really believe that. What about being chosen? Well, the Bible says, and I'll just read it real quickly, and I hadn't planned on reading this, but just thinking about it, I will. Over in Ephesians chapter 1, it says in, uh, in Ephesians chapter 1 that, that uh, let me see if I can read it exactly, because I want to read verse 3 before I read verse 4. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Now, it says in the heavenly, and in the English it has places. It's not in the original. And in verse 4 it says, Just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before Him. And then in part of verse 4 and verse 5, new sentence, it says, In love He predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to Himself according to the kind intention of His will. He's chosen you before anything existed. Well, if He chose you before anything existed, it would tell me it had nothing to do with you. Would that be right? He predestined us to, to basically be adopted by Him. Well, with 1 Samuel... In chapter 2, verse 26, this is after his, his mother, Hannah, had basically said, If you'll give me a son, I'll dedicate him to the Lord. He'll be yours. And he'll serve you all of his life. And that's what she did when he was born. And she did get pregnant. And she did have a baby. And after he was weaned, she took him to live with Eli, the high priest. And he stayed there and ministered from the time he was a small boy. Now, Eli had two sons that were also priests, not the high priest, but they were wicked. The Bible says they did not know God. They did not know God. Now, I used to say, I did not know God and He did not know me. Well, that was wrong because He's always known me because He's God and He's all-knowing. That's actually in my book. And if you've read that in my book, then I want to apologize right now. And believe me, if I were writing that again, that would not be in there because He always knew me because He's God. Now, I did not know that. But the same Eli that raised those two sons that were wicked, and if you read in 1 Samuel, you'll see these weren't good guys at all. He also was the one now that was raising Samuel. Now his mother would come and go, but Eli was the one that had him all the time. And look what it says in verse 26 in chapter 2. 
It says, Now the boy Samuel was growing in stature and in favor both with the Lord, and that word is Yahweh, I am. That word is Jesus. This is the pre-incarnate Christ. In favor with Yahweh, Jesus, and with men. Now, do you know who else this same thing is said about? This is said about the young Jesus. As he was growing, he grew in favor and in stature. He grew in favor with men and with the Lord. Now, how can you grow in favor when you belong to the Lord? You say, well, that was God's son. So are you. So are you. I don't think that as we grow in favor with the Lord, it's not that he likes us more and more and more. That's not it. We come to know that he's liking us more and more and more. His thinking never changed because he's eternal. In fact, one of the things that he is, one of his characteristics, one of his nature, about his nature is that he is immutable. That means unchanging. You have always been in favor with God. You just didn't know it. Now, as he was growing, uh, this is what was said about Jesus, and this was the way that God feels about you and about me. Now, this had nothing to do with Samuel, but it had everything to do with Yahweh, with Jesus, with the pre-incarnate Christ. It was, it was the Lord that was growing him. And I said before, the same person, Eli, that was raising Samuel was the same person that, that raised these two wicked sons. Now, I don't understand this, but it does show God's grace. And I have this question, and this was for me. I, I asked a question. I said, Lord, why did Samuel walk in Yahweh, walk in Christ, and Eli's two sons didn't? I don't know. You could say it another way. Why did Samuel believe God from the very beginning and Eli's two sons didn't. Some people could say it was because the mother dedicated him to the Lord. That's not it. That's not it. Some of the, some of the greatest men of faith that have ever been known did not come from a godly background. And yet they walked in Christ. This is all God. And here's the bottom line. There are just some things I understand and some things that I don't understand. There just are. There just are. Well, Samuel had been dedicated fully to the Lord from before his birth. And here he is. And I could ask a question. I would ask it this way in the past. I would say, have you given your children to the Lord? Thinking that it would be up to you. It's not up to you. God loves your children whether you've given them to the Lord or not. And I've also seen some parents that have raised children. I don't understand this. And their children basically have not followed the Lord at all. I don't understand that. But I can tell you this, there are some people that think they've raised their children the right way and all they've raised them under is law. And then they wonder why their children rebel. Raising children under law doesn't set them on the right path. It doesn't. If you could do anything that would help your children more than anything, you could tell your children from a very early age, Jesus loves you because he does, period. And convince your children how much Jesus loves them and show them just by loving them yourself. Now, that does not mean you won't discipline your children. You will. Well, I'm going to read 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 1 through 21, the whole chapter, and then we're going to just talk about it. Now, the chapter is going to explain itself pretty much. That's the great thing about the Word of God. It just explains itself. But then we are going to talk about it. Now, the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord before Eli. And word from the Lord was rare in those days. We're going to talk about that. Visions were infrequent. It happened at, the, at that time as Eli was lying down in his place. Now his eyesight had begun to grow dim and he could not see very well. And the lamp of God had not gone out. Now folks, there's a lot of wicked stuff going on around here. But this says that the lamp of God had not gone out. Folks, I'm going to tell you, the lamp of God will never go out any place. And Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was. We're going to talk about that. And the Lord called Samuel and, and he said, Here I am. Then he ran to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call. Lie down again. So he went and laid down. The Lord called yet again, Samuel. So Samuel arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he answered, I did not call, my son. Lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, 
nor had the word of the Lord yet been received, I'm sorry, been revealed to him. Now notice it says the word of the Lord had not been revealed to him. Did God already love Samuel? Yes. Had Samuel already been set apart? Yes. Did Samuel know it? No. It says that Samuel did not know Yahweh yet. God is getting ready to reveal himself to the boy Samuel. It's not about what we do. It's about what he does. Okay. Verse 8. So the Lord called Samuel again for the third time, and he, arose, and he arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. Then Eli discerned that the Lord was calling the boy. And Eli said to Samuel, Go lie down, and it shall... And, I'm sorry. And he says, Go lie down, and it shall be if he calls you, that you shall say, you shall say Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. I like that, in his place. I think it's interesting he put that. Wherever you are is the place where you're to lie down. Wherever you are is the place where you're to rest. That's another message. Then in verse 10, Then the Lord came and stood, I like that, came and stood and called, as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, Speak, for your servant is listening. The Lord said to Samuel, Behold, I am about to do a thing in Israel at which both ears of everyone who hears it will tingle. I like that. Verse 12, In that day I will carry out against Eli all I have spoken concerning his house from beginning to end. For I have told him that I am about to judge the house forever for the iniquity which he knew because his sons brought a curse on themselves and he did not rebuke them. Now, when you read this, if you're not careful, if you don't read things like this through the lens of grace, you'll think, yep, there it is. God's going to get them. God's going to straighten them out. You know, yes, the Bible says there was a curse brought on Eli's sons. But I am so glad in the book of Galatians, it said that cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree and that literally Jesus Christ became our curse. And so the curse that was meant for those that disobey was taken on the, the person of Jesus. Were Eli's sons, did they ever believe God? I have no idea, and neither do you. But I'm going to say this, that don't read this. This is where God judges in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, God is saves. Couldn't be further from the truth. Verse 14, Therefore I have sworn to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be atoned for by sacrifice or offering forever. Now, I want to say this. No iniquity in your house or in anyone else's house can be attain, uh, obtained or atoned for by anything that you do. No sacrifice that you do. There's only one sacrifice, and that's the sacrifice of the God-man, Jesus, that could ever do this. So Samuel lay down until morning. Then he opened the doors of the house of the Lord. But Samuel was afraid to tell the vision to Eli. Then Eli called Samuel and, and said, Samuel, my son. And he said, Here I am. He said, What is the word that he spoke to you? Please do not hide it from me. May God do so to you. And more also, if you had anything from me, all of all the words that he spoke to you. So Samuel told him everything and he hid nothing from him. And he said, It is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. That was Eli speaking. Then there's in verse 19, we're saying it basically again, the same thing that was in verse 4. Or early in the, in, I'm sorry, in chapter 2, verse 26. Then Samuel grew, and the Lord was with him, and let none of his words fail. Verse 20. All Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, knew that Samuel was confirmed as a prophet of the Lord. And the Lord appeared again at Shiloh because the Lord revealed himself to Samuel at Shiloh by the word of the Lord. Now I'm going to talk about that verse 2 at the end. I want to say God calls people while they're ministering. Now Samuel was ministering before the Lord even when he didn't know what he was doing. Samuel was going about just working. He was working for God. Now does that mean he was wrong to do that? Nope. Nope. It's not your job to do anything for the Lord to speak to you. You don't do anything so that the Lord will speak to you. It's not your job to find out the will of God for your life. Never has been. You don't do anything to find the, word of, of the will of God for you. God reveals His will to you. 
God called Samuel while he was going about his normal life. Same thing with you. Now, my, God may call while nothing is happening in our lives at all. And God sometimes calls the very unlikely to special circumstances, special situations. Now, understand, I'm going to say this. I'm not even going to spend a lot of time trying to defend it, but I'm going to tell you that God calls people, period. And God calls a lot more people than we would have ever thought. Who does God call? Everyone. He calls them to Himself. Does that mean everyone responds positively? I don't think so. I don't understand all this. But I'm telling you, He didn't say, I'm picking Him, and I'm picking Him, and I'm picking Him. There are those that teach that. I'm not going to fall out with them. I just think they're wrong. God calls people. If I had time, and I went over it this morning in my own mind, to show there's a definite order. And the Bible starts out with foreknowledge. God foreknew you. You know what that means? God knew before. That's what that means. God knew you before He did anything. Your situation with God has nothing to do with you. You say, well, you must believe. Yes, I believe you must believe. I do. But you're believing what He's already done and what He's already given to you is yours. Now, He's given it to you whether you believe it or not. That's foreknowledge. Foreknowledge talks about predestination. Who is He predestined? Who is He called? There's an order. And I'm going to say this, all men. Who did He die for? The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14, that when Christ died, all died. It also says in verse 15 that when Christ was raised, all were raised in Christ. All were made alive in Christ. Now, I don't understand all that. I'm just telling you what the Bible says. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14 and 15. Read them. I had a pastor tell me one time, you know, those verses have always troubled me because it does say all. That's what it says. And it troubled him because what the Bible said wasn't what he believed. So we'll just let that go. Well, he was a boy, not a man. Samuel was remaining close to God when he was called. The Bible says, also draw near to God and he will draw near to you. In, in Romans 8, verse I will read these. Romans 8, verse uh, 29 and 30. Everybody knows uh, Romans 8, 28. But 29 and 30 follow Romans 8, 28. Find it right here. He says, For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his Son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And these whom he called, he also justified. And these whom He justified, He also glorified. People have the idea it starts with calling. It doesn't. It starts with foreknowledge. And there's an order here. But see, this, this was way down the line when God called Samuel. He'd already determined in His mind. And the same thing that was true for Samuel was true for other folks. You say, well, all people don't respond like Samuel. No, they don't. And I don't understand why some do and some don't. Sometimes God's call is mistaken as others calling. Sometimes I think that mamas have called children to be preachers. He's going to be a preacher. And they totally misunderstand what it is to be a preacher. To be a preacher is not to stand in a pulpit and share with a group of people. One of the words that's used for preach in the, in the, in the Bible is the word gossip. We gossip the gospel. Everyone is called to be a preacher. Just to share Christ as they go. Robinson. As you go, everyone is called to be a preacher. Because that's who you are. It's not what you do. But sometimes people think it's others calling them. Sometimes God will reveal things to you through people. Well, Samuel in verse 4 and verse 6 and verse 8 thought that it was Eli calling him. Now, we need to realize that man cannot call you to obey God. Only God can do that. Now, man can tell you things, but you have to know God personally. You have, to, you have to believe Him. Now, when we talk about obedience, I'm going to talk about obedience here in a minute, and then again later. And people say, we must be obedient to God. And the next thing you know, they're giving you a list of rules to keep, a list of things to do, a list of things not to do. And we call that being obedient. But if you read John chapter 3, verse 36, it equates that Obedience is believing God. Obedience is not what you do so much. Obedience is in whom you believe. As you understand that Christ is your life, 
and you believe that He has given His life to you, what you do changes. If you think that obedience is determined by what you do or don't do, then know this, you'll never be obedient to God. Because some things you think are the right thing to do are going to be the wrong thing to do. And some things you may think are the wrong thing to do would be the right thing to do. So if obedience is determined by what you do or don't do, then you have no hope. God is the one who reveals to us not only what we do, but who we are. You see, who we are determines what we do. Okay. God's call on one's life may be revealed through another person. Sometimes others recognize a call of God on your life when you don't. Now, this is true for everyone. I used to say for everyone who's been saved and called to Him. Well, I can tell you this. What Christ did for one man, He did for all men. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life. But God demonstrates His own love toward you, and that while you were yet a sinner, Christ died for you. The Bible said that we've been reconciled to God, this is Romans 5.10, while we were an enemy. The Bible says in Romans 5.18 that because of the obedience of the one, talking about the last Adam, Jesus, the justification of life was given to all men. So the key thing here is all men. Why do some respond by belief and some don't? Don't understand that. Well, God's call to obedience in verse 9 should encourage everyone. Let me read verse 9 again. And Samuel said, I'm sorry, and Eli said to Samuel, Go lie down, and it shall be, if he calls you, that you shall say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. Speak, Lord, your servant is listening. And Samuel went to lay down in his place. Now, this is really interesting. Do you know where Samuel was laying down, where Samuel was sleeping, the Bible says, in another place? It says that he was sleeping where the ark is. That's where he was sleeping. You know what we call that? Where was he sleeping? I don't understand this. That's right. The Holy of Holies. That's where the ark was. The fact that Eli was putting Samuel there was putting Samuel at great risk. Why did Samuel not die? I don't understand that. But there was a special thing going on between God and Samuel before Samuel knew anything. Now, you remember, the mercy seat is on top of the ark. You have the ark of the covenant right here. And the mercy seat is on top of the ark. And that's where once a year the high priest would go in there and, and sprinkle blood shed from, from the innocent animal that represented the cleansing of the sin of the nation of Israel one time a year. And that mercy seat, the word for it in the Greek is propitiation. Where that one would die for another, literally to purchase one. Propitiation. That was a picture of the cross. So Samuel, even when he didn't understand anything, was joined to the cross. Even when he didn't understand anything. I just think that's very interesting. Well, others could see something going on in his life, and even when he didn't, he would see it. And then he, was, he said, go and go back, and, and then another place to do whatever he tells you. Well, I want to say this. What did Samuel do different after Eli talked to him? Nothing. That's exactly right, honey. He did nothing different. And that's what God wants from you. He doesn't want you to do anything different. He wants you to be who you are. Be who you are, where you are, wherever that is. We have the idea that when God calls you, He's going to move you someplace. Maybe not. It doesn't matter. Because wherever you are, you're going to be the same. Your husband went with me, and I wish I really wanted you to say how that affected him. But I think what David saw while we were in Romania, while I was preaching to people, you know, when you show up and you're from out of town, they think you're an expert. You know, what an expert is, somebody who's from out of town carrying a briefcase. That's an expert. And so they thought I was a big dog while I was in Romania. Well, people here, they said, well, Craig, you're the one that speaks to us every week. It's no big deal. We know you. We know you have flaws. You're just Craig. Well, folks, I was just Craig over there too. But here's the thing. I think David saw this. I was the same in Romania as I am in the living room. Same person. Doesn't change. If you change based on where you are, one of you is fake. If you're different in the pulpit than you are in the bathroom, 
one of you is fake. I used to say about Adrian Rogers, somebody I love dearly. And for whatever reason, he chose to be my friend. I have no idea, but he did. And I've told many people this, and I said, you know, Dr. Rogers was the same in the pulpit and in the bathroom, and I've been both places with him. He was the same. That's the one of the things that I loved about Adrian Rogers. You want to know what Adrian Rogers was like? Look at what he preaches. He was the same all the time. I believe Dr. Rogers, as God began to grow him, you say, Adrian Rogers, he grew? Well, of course he did. Because that's how we do things. God grows us. I believe at the end of his life, Dr. Rogers was beginning to preach grace with more fervor than he ever did before. But he was the same man all the time, no matter where he was. Same with Samuel, same with you. God's call to obedience, and or understand this, obedience equals believing. I believe it should encourage others to obey the Lord. What does it mean to obey the Lord? To believe Him. Do you know that faith is contagious? The word pistuo is the word for believe and faith. Believe, to believe is the verb. Faith is the noun. It's the same word. In the Greek, the words are built off the verb. In the English, they're built off the noun. But as we trust God and believe God, it encourages other people to do what? Trust God and believe God. Sue, as you were trusting God while you were going through those terrible things that you had to go through, it caused others to believe Him. And they can look at your life and say, man, she trusted Christ. Johnny, as you were going through that with Sue and it was different, in some ways I think it may be harder for the ones that are, that are watching somebody they love go through stuff. But as they saw you trust God, others trusted God through you. It's the same thing about anything. Trust God financially. Others learned about that. Trust God when it's a physical situation. Trust God when there's a problem in the family with the children. You trust God. You know this, that even when your children are going through terrible stuff, even when they're terribly disobedient, God doesn't stop loving them. Never. I don't understand all that stuff. But as you understand that, others are going to say, that's what I want right there. That's obedience. Continuing to listen to and believe God. As you continue to do that, others are going to be drawn to that. That's obedience. Eli told Samuel he should obey the Lord. Eli was telling Samuel to do something that he hadn't even done. You know, truth's truth, no matter where it comes from. Truth came out of a donkey's mouth. Do you remember? When, when Baal, or Balaam, excuse me, Balaam, uh, and the donkey spoke to Balaam. And you say, a donkey spoke? Yep, truth's truth. See, there is no new truth. All truth comes from God. Don't care where it comes from. Can somebody that doesn't know God speak truth? Of course he can. Because the Bible says that God directs the hearts of the king just like he does the course of the rivers. Well, God's call is persistent and should always be heard. Verse 10, the Lord came and stood and called as the other time, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, speak for your servant is listening. I have to ask the question sometime when something, when uh, literally a call will come into my mind, I'll hear something and I'll, I'll think that's the Lord. So fine, I've just asked, Lord, is that you? I've asked that question. Is that you? And he's told me in my spirit, yes, this is me. Now, some people have the idea that God would never speak directly to your spirit. I say, how sad that is. How sad that is. Because of course he does. Now, will it ever be contrary to scripture? I don't think so. No, it won't. But God may direct in your mind, I want you to go this way. And you say, what's a good reason for going that way? There isn't one except I want you to go this way. And you do that. And you say, well, go this way. Do this. Don't do this. Say this to that person. Don't say anything to that person. That's the Spirit of God talking to you in that still, small voice. It's, I don't think it's any accident that he was speaking to Samuel at night because at night he wasn't busy. Sometimes the trouble comes. We're so busy we're too busy to even hear God. Samuel was so busy doing, quote-unquote, the Lord's work, he couldn't hear him during the day. So he had to be al you know, alone at night when there was nothing else going on and God would speak to him. So, a lot of times God speaks to my heart and my mind while I'm in the shower. Nothing else is going on. Well, that's really quite amazing. God's call should lead to sharing truth with those around you. Verse 17, that's what he did. At least, and he said, what is the word that he spoke to you? Please do not hide it from me. 
That's what Eli told him. And then Samuel shared some things with him that he didn't want to. Verse 18, God's call must be obeyed. Remember, obedience equals believing faith. God's call must be believed. You don't have trouble doing things that you believe, do you? When you believe something firmly in your heart, you don't have any trouble going ahead with that belief and acting out on what you believe and what you know to be true. So Samuel, verse 18, told him everything and hid nothing from him. And he said, it is the Lord. And this is what Eli said, it is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. Reading this, it's one of the first times that I see Eli saying, yep, I can trust God. I don't understand all that, but I believe that's what happened. Afraid, uh, Samuel was afraid to tell Eli. Sometimes we're afraid to obey God's call, but we must obey. We must do what God leads us to do. His call leads us to do. When we believe heavy in our heart a certain way and it seems contrary to what I want to do, sometimes it's difficult. You say, Lord, I can't do this. Have you ever said that? Lord, I can't do this. I've said it many times. Lord, I can't do this. And he says, I know you can't physically, but I'm going to do it through you. And yes, it will be you. I've heard people say, well, that's not me, that's God. That's not me, that's God. Well, I want to tell you, yes, that's you. And it's God. Because you see you in Christ. You see you're one with Christ. When you, when you do things that are impossible for you to do, that's still you. Because that's who you really are. That's who you are in Christ. The wisdom that God had given this little boy, that couldn't be him, and yet it was him. Because God had chosen for it to be that way. Had Samuel not obeyed God toward Eli, I don't believe that he would have become the righteous judge of Israel. I don't understand all that either. I want to say this about Samuel. As this small child, and Robinson was speaking this morning in Pakistan about the kingdom of God as like a child. I'm going to tell you something. Samuel, as this small child, had no desire for self-promotion. So many of the preachers that I see on TV, they make me sick. I'm sorry. I know God loves them, but they make me sick. They make me want to vomit. And everything they do, or most everything they do that I see is about self-promotion. I'm going to tell you, with the call of God, there will be no desire for self-promotion. There will only be desire to tell people the truth. And the truth is, God loves you. Now, I want to say this. What if people don't receive this truth and obey what, by believing? What if they won't believe this and receive it as their own? Then they won't benefit from it. It's still given, but they will not benefit from it. They will not. They must believe. And I believe this can lead to an eternity of disobedience, of not believing. I believe it's real. But I'm going to tell you that from God's perspective, it's never changed. What God has given, He gave from a long time past. Well, God's... You hear the phone? We are in a living room. Okay. God's call leads to growth. It leads to speaking the truth. Samuel didn't have any choice. He spoke the truth. Last thing I want to share. Obedience to God's call will be recognized by others. Verse 20. Let me read verse 20 and then I'll read verse 21. This is really, really cool. It says, verse 20... All Israel, from Dan even to Beersheba, knew that Samuel was confirmed as a prophet of the Lord, a prophet of Yahweh, prophet. He's somebody who's not only a forth teller, could be a foreteller too, but he's somebody who's never wrong. You know, as long as you're sharing the truths that Jesus loves you and tell people what he's done for them, do you know that you will never be wrong? I don't care what the situation is. You tell someone, this is what Christ has done for you. This is what Christ has given you. He has given you Himself. And if you believe this, you're going to benefit from it. But whether you believe it or not, it's still been done. You'll never be wrong. And the people will recognize you. Their people will be drawn to you. I had a fellow call me yesterday. And this guy would certainly not agree with what I've been preaching for a good while. And he told me he'd been going to a bunch of counselors and finally it dawned on him, these aren't the ones that I need to see. And he said, God told me to call you. That may not seem like a big deal to you, but it is a big deal. First of all, he humbled himself to me, number one. Don't know what the situation is, doesn't matter. I know the solution. His name is Jesus. 
I know what he's to do. Stop and start. Stop what? All he's doing. Start what? Believing Christ. If you're going to stop and start something, let it be that. Stop doing what you do, everything good or bad, and start believing Jesus. And he said more than once, God told me to call you. God told me to call you. You preach this message, others will see it. And they'll know there's a prophet in Israel. Folks, wherever you are, people will know that there's a prophet. There's somebody who foretells and foretells the truth that Jesus loves men. Well, God reveals himself to who he will. And God's calling for one man affected all Israel. All of Israel was changed because, first of all, Hannah believed Yahweh. As a result, she gave her son. It wasn't about what she did for, for Samuel because she wasn't even around. I mean, she would come maybe once a year, make him a coat, make him a tunic, do whatever. But it was because God chose Samuel and Samuel believed God. God's call on one man's life can lead to victory for a nation. Israel changed as a result. And God's call for for uh, a nation will result, result in God's name being known in all the world. Let me tell you, Samuel believed God. God said, Samuel, they want a king. They're not rejecting you, they're rejecting me. And God chose Saul, and Samuel anointed him. And then when Saul, you know, didn't measure up, because he can't, and then God chose David, and he anointed him through Samuel. And the Bible describes this. David was a man after God's own heart. Now David messed up mightily. You know the story. But folks, here it is. When you're talking to somebody, you don't know who you're talking to. Samuel didn't even know who David was. He didn't know who Saul was. And yet, God said, these are the ones that I've chosen. Samuel just only knew the Lord. And he told him at the appropriate time. And then he said this, and this is the last thing I'm going to finish with. In verse 21, the Bible says, The Lord appeared again at Shiloh because the Word revealed Himself to Samuel at Shiloh. I want you to see how big this is. Wherever you are, that's where the Lord's going to show up. Because you see, God is revealing His Word, who is a person Jesus, not just the written word, His word is Jesus. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. We're talking about Jesus. Jesus is the word. Now, don't misunderstand what I'm saying. This is not the word. Jesus is the word. Is this inspired? Yes. Do I believe it? Yes. There were some things written the other day, and they were discussing back and forth. Is all of it inspired? Yes. All of it. Is inspired. Do I understand it all? No. But folks, wherever you are, that's where the Word of God shows up. Because you're in Christ and Christ is in you. It's not about you, it's about Him. Any time and place that God Jesus reveals Himself to you, God slash Jesus, then He's appearing in that place because not only is He there, but so are you. This is pretty big. All that was given to Samuel has been given to you. I got nothing else for you, and see you next time.